No, I'm on the phone. Hello, everyone. I, I think we're, we're live now. So uh, welcome. I'm Ariana Cohen-Halberstam. I'm the Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film. And this is the launch of the Boston Jewish Film Streaming Cinematheque. We have several programs coming up over the next few weeks and over the next few months. Um, next week, I hope you can join us. We will be doing a preview of Vishniak, which is a new film by Laura Bialis uh, with producers Nancy Spielberg, Roberta Grossman, and Sophie Sartain uh, all joining us. Um, check out our website for what's coming up. But tonight we have a really special program and I'm so excited to be bringing it to you. Um, so before we get started, I wanna thank IFC Films and I wanna thank Tamar Simon from Mean Streets Management who made this all possible. Um, we have, we knew we were gonna have a great panel tonight and we ended up with an even stronger one than we knew we were gonna have. So uh, first I wanna introduce jo director Jonathan Jakubowicz who's one of Venezuela's most celebrated filmmakers and writers. His feature film, his first feature film, Sequestro Express, became Venezuela's highest grossing film. Um, his next film, Hands of Stone, premiered at Cannes Film Festival and had a 15 minute standing ovation afterwards. And that very same year, he published his first novel. So um, it's not a surprise he was able to bring us such a powerful, powerful film. Um, if you can spotlight Jonathan just to wave hello. Uh, hello. There we go. <laughs> um, we also have with us actor Jesse Eisenberg, who's an Academy Award winning actor and acclaimed playwright and author. His film credits include Roger Dodger, The Squid and the Whale, Adventureland, The Social Network, and so much more. He has written four plays. He's a frequent contributor to The New Yorker magazine um, and is currently working on his feature film directorial debut. Um, so Jesse, hello, thank you for joining us. Oh, and he's muted. Okay. Hi, Ariana, and, by, and, and the greater Boston area. Um, we also have Matthias Schweighofer, um, who you will recognize from this film as Klaus Barbie. He is a producer and actor on this film. He starred in both TV and in film, both in English and in German, his native language, um, and has starred in over 70 projects, including Val Valkyrie in 2008 and Night Train, and has also directed and produced many projects. And finally, oh, sorry, say hello. I can see you there. So uh, hello to Matthias. Hello. Hello. Hi, Ariana. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> from, the, from, from another time zone and someone else in the same time zone as you, you're in Berlin. Um, and Bella Ramsey is joining us from England. And she made her professional acting debut as Liana Mormont in Game of Thrones. She's also the titular character in The Worst Witch and is currently filming the second series of his dark materials for HBO. Um, she also films uh, opposite Renee Zellweger and Judy. Hello, Bella. Hello. <laughs> Hello, it's good to be here. And later this evening, there will be a switch um, where Jonathan becomes Claudine, who is another producer. Uh, we'll, we'll introduce her later on this evening. Um, so I want to start by asking uh, you, Jonathan, uh, how you came to this story. This is not, you know, everyone has heard of Marcel Marceau. This is nothing, you know, not a story I knew of his at all. Um, and I sort of did a double take when I first read the plot synopsis. I said, is it the same Marcel Marceau? So how did you come to learn this story? Well, um, first of all, that was exactly my reaction when I first heard that Marcel Marceau was, first of all, Jewish and that he saved children during the war. I had absolutely no idea. And that in itself it really grabbed my interest. And I started doing a little bit of research. And um, when I went to the Cannes Film Festival to premiere my film, Hands of Stone, I was able to track down Marcel's first cousin, George Loinger who was 106 at the time. And I met with him and he started telling me firsthand this whole story. He was the head of the Jewish Boy Scouts of France during the war. He was at the center of this whole operation. And in fact, in the movie, he's the one that brings Marcel on board. And after I heard his story, I felt there was nothing I could do, you know, be before I could get this movie made. And, and that's what I did, you know, it was sheer um, impression about the heroism of these characters and, 
and the value of a person who is 106 and has not had his story told. He unfortunately passed away at 108 when we were in post-production, but uh, his family has been extremely supportive of the film, you know, after that. And, and I, in a way, we feel the, the movie honored him. 106, I mean, it's incredible that you got to meet him um, and um, tell his story and tell this unknown story of Marcel Marceau. Um, why, why did you feel like this was a story that needed to be told then? Was it because you had met him or, or was there something in the core of the story that spoke to your own experience? Well, it was, it was two things. I mean, my family on both sides are, are Holocaust survivors. And I, I never really thought I could make a movie about the war because of it was too personal and too emotional for me. But his story was a story about salvation and not about extermination. And it was a story about taking responsibility and a group of civilian heroes who decide to leave everything aside and, and you know, make a difference and save others. And it's also the story about an artist who finds his own voice and his own art by renouncing his ego and putting his art at the service of, you know, saving children. And those elements I frankly had never seen in, in a World War II film. There's been a gigantic amount of great World War II films. So to find some one story that felt different from all others, made me feel that, you know, it was worth the effort and, and happily, you know, here we are and we were able to pull it out. Jesse, I'm really interested, you know, you've obviously played um, characters based on real people before. Um, what was it like to become Marcel? You, he's obviously, I imagine you had to look at video, he's no longer alive and you weren't able to meet with him. Um, but he is also an artist. So can you talk a little bit about becoming Marcel for this role? Yeah, I mean, I have like way more in common than I expected initially. I mean, our families come from a very small area in Poland that uh, like his, where his father's family is from or my father's family are from, uh, are like maybe an hour's drive away in Poland. Um, uh, I grew up as the son of a birthday party clown. So I was kind of around clowning um, my whole life. Um, but, um, in terms of like the actual process of working on the, this particular movie, um, I had this amazing mind teacher, um, who w studied with Marceau for years in his, at his school in France, but also has become like a chronicler of Marceau's life. So he gave me this like two pronged education, like one on the actual mime routines that he choreographed and also on like the history of mime and the history of Marceau. So, you know, like. I, I could speak for the three actors on this call right now and say like anytime you do a movie you kind of like dabble in something for a few weeks and then you know forget about it after it's over but this was like one of those unusual processes that just required me to do more um and um and uh yeah and then like yeah and then I mean and like I guess yeah it just required like a little more because I had to be like one of the best you know he had a, he had to look like he can grow into somebody who'd become what we think of as the best mind. Yeah, and it, you see that even in the in the course of the film, it ends with this beautiful, um, your beautiful enactment. I, I imagine that was a, a real performance that happened uh, in front of the American soldiers. Yeah, yeah. So Marceau became like a translator for the American army um, after the war. Um, he was good with languages, and um, he ended up. Yeah, somebody had heard like one of the soldiers heard that he does this, that he, he can do this routine or that he can perform in this way. And so they recommended him to perform for General Patton's troops. So that um, scene at the end is, yeah, it's a real, you know, it's based on a real uh, event. I thought the framing of it, of the film with, um, with, the, with Patton speaking to his troops was really an interesting choice. And I think as an American watching, it's brought the story home even, even more deeply. Um, can you talk a little bit about that choice? Uh, I guess that's a question for Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I, you know, when the, the less likely war hero you can think of is a mime, you know, and, and, and the more famous war hero, at least in that war, is probably General Patton. The fact that you are introduced by General Patton 
to a hero and the hero turns out to be a mime, you know, I found extremely unique and telling about what the story really is. You know, I, I, I feel like there, there is something that is left out in many, in many stories about the war, which is the people who made a, re a difference and took responsibility. And I felt like the best invitation that could be given to admire a civilian hero is, is by having the traditional hero invite you. Plus it was true, you know, I mean, there, there is a beautiful speech when Marcel was given the, uh, the Medal of Honor, the Wallenberg Medal of Honor, in which he speaks about this episode. And he brags about having his first review in the Stars and Stripes magazine of the American Marines. And, you know, I just found it unique and beautiful and a, and a great way to, you know, frame the whole tale. And, and like you said, bring it home. You know, it, it's, it's why this story is universal, even if you all you care about is, is weapons and army. You know, it, it is the time to admire a mime. Yeah, and, that, and it, it gives, I mean, it's, it, it really puts the heart part of the film against the the brutality sort of of war. So I think it works really beautifully. But of course the film actually opens with you, Bella, um, in this scene. And I, again, I thought that scene was so moving. It's it's you um, saying the Shema before, saying the prayer before you go to bed with your father and these um, scenes of you and your father and then, um, and then of course being an orphan and then again, um, the um, relationship of Marcel and his father um, really ran throughout the film. Can you talk a little bit about your preparation for the role, Bella? Um, I was, I'm, I've always been like aware of, uh, of Judaism. I, I learned about it in school. I was, I'm a Christian, so I've always been like aware of Jewish history. Um, I, I just tried to immerse myself more in it and uh like i found learning like a couple of hebrew words actually really helpful mm. um, I, I went to a, a holocaust museum uh just a, a couple of weeks before we started shooting and that helped yeah again kind of just bring it home like really get in like really understand the the horror and the atrocity of it um and jonathan was really helpful we we created a a, a backstory and obviously it's kind of elspeth is based loosely off his uh, aunt so again it just gave it even more weight so I just tried to kind of immerse myself in in the character and in her history and just as I've uh, just as interjecting here to tell everyone if you want to ask questions there's a QA um, box on the bottom we'll be opening it up to some of those questions later on just let us know if you don't want to appear on camera then we won't call you up but otherwise um, we will invite you up to ask questions in a few minutes um, the roles are all, I mean, you play such a distinct role compared to Matthias, and it's interesting to you know, ask the three of you questions here because you all touch on such different parts of humanity here um, or the lack thereof. Matthias, I'm really interested because you're also a producer in this film and you're playing I mean, it's such a, a monstrous character, but part of your, the monstrosity, I guess, of the character, monstrosity of the character is that you're um, so charming in the role. And um, and you you're likable and and d despicable at the same time. Um, first of all, how why why what was it like to become Klaus Barbie for this role, and um, and how did you choose to play the role like that? Um, were you doing research about who he was as well, or uh, what was the relationship working with Jonathan on that role? Oh yeah. Uh, uh... Oh, we're losing you. First, when Jonathan, he, the way into this movie and into the character, that was a crazy journey because um, honestly, I've never heard of Klaus Barbie before uh, uh, because we, we never talked about him in school or history because he's a, when I talked to Jonathan, he's such a cultural problem in a way for Germany because the time, he was in the Second World War, and, but, but the time after, till the, the end of his life, it's, just, it's such a crazy story about, this, about a guy who was evil, about a guy who was clever, about a guy who was so, um, 
it, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's such a huge story and it's, it's, uh, I don't know what to say, huh, Jonathan? It's, uh, he's, a, he's a monster, like uh, the whole story, his whole biography, what he did and what he did after and what he did till the end of his life. Um, but yeah, when Jonathan called me and said, yeah, you want to play this part? We, we, we met us in Berlin and he said, it would be great if you could play the part. And I said, <laughs> no doubt, I'm in. Okay, I do it. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you want me, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, let's do it all in because the world needs to know this story about Marcel and um, about the shadows of German government in the, uh, yeah after the second world war and everything and in the second world war, it's because this guy is crazy and this guy is uh yeah this uh yeah somebody somebody is asking here in the q a um alexander chelminski is asking that he's he's seen you play marcel reich Renicki in a in a movie of a history movie about Renicki's life during yeah, the Holocaust, yeah. um, and he's wondering how playing the victim and the perpetrator affect you how did you take those roles into your life and and um, moving between those roles, how does that affect you? Mm, in a way, to play Marcel, uh, I, I met him in person, and his life was so great. He, he's uh, for, for for you guys. You, you, I don't know if you know him. He was one of the biggest um, critical writers for German literature, and uh, uh, he just fought his way through the war. Uh, be, because of his thoughts when he thought about Shakespeare, Schiller, Goethe, and everything. That's he. He was a, he was an amazing character and an amazing an amazing human being. Uh, and to play this his life to 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 go back to Warsaw, to go back into the ghetto and everything to play this character was uh, so interesting and so respectful and it was so crazy to and and um, yeah. Um, touching to play his life and uh, and after that to you know uh, 10 years later i don't know eight years later to play klaus barbie to see the opposite uh yeah, we lost you first. this is a real story and these these were real human beings i think you dropped out for a second yeah, the connection. Well, well, yeah. Yeah, the connection is horrible. Yeah, we we're, were dropping out a little bit, but. Okay. Only when you mention Barbie for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but then to, to play Klaus Barbie, it feels so unreal that these people were real now, you know, to, to in a time like this, to play these, these characters and it's, 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 it feels weird. It's, it's, but it's necessary. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea of giving, giving, um, giving a real character to these, to both, I mean, to both sides of this, the scene I want, I would love for both you and um, for you and for Jesse to talk, because I think the scene in the train is um, one of the most powerful films, uh, one of the most powerful scenes in the film. Um, and if you can both talk, and maybe Jonathan too, about sort of, and Bella, all, all of you are incredible with that, with that scene. It's so tense and so, um, it was the second time I watched it the other day and it was still, um, I knew what was gonna happen and I still was on the edge of my seat. And I would love for you to talk about that, how you decided to have that scene. Did, did Marcel, Marcel actually meet Klaus Barbie and, and how did that scene come to be? I have to say the scene is just so good because I was so starstruck because I, was such a huge fan of Jesse, and, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm still a huge fan. And that was my moment. I stood in front of him, and it was only 20, 20 centimeters between me and him. And it was just like, I just was like, okay, can I have an autograph and a picture? <laughs> oh, I had the exact like, well, same ex same experience, but like on the other hand, like I, it was so eerie and so great, and it was the first time I had seen Matthias in the character, you know, and I just went off to Jonathan. I was like, oh my God, he's unbelievable. It's so eerie. It's so, yeah, it was so great. But what was, I mean, what's really great about Matthias and that scene, as I remember it, is that he's so sweet. Um, and as my character, I can't reconcile this human being in front of me that is behaving like a normal person 
and behaving like a sensitive normal person and a contemplative person, but everything else I know about him is pure terror. And, um, and then there's an actor in front of me who's also doing both of those things. It's just an unusual experience. My favorite part of the scene is something that I just learned about from Jonathan like a week ago doing one of these, which I'll just mention on Jonathan's behalf because um, I thought it was just so clever the way he put it, which is that it's really in addition to the, in addition to the, you know, uh, the scene being the kind of protagonist and antagonist kind of meeting, it's really a scene about kind of different ideologies in conflict. You know, um, the ideology of the Nazis is one of like, it's the highest example of rigidity and formal and, you know, and formality. Um, whereas the Jewish artist uh, comes from a place of, of, you know, of having to kind of figure out, especially at that time, figuring out a way to survive, um, but also just coming from like a different cultural ideology and how these two things at this moment are irreconcilable that the Nazi is asking the Jew, you know, um, you know, what's the best way to raise my daughter? And the Jewish perspective on it is let her be curious and, you know, let her figure it out and don't push her. And the Nazi ideology is, runs completely counter to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jonathan, did you want to add anything to that? Or it's a really interesting yeah. point. I mean, I think that, I mean, first of all, you know, going a little back to what you were telling Matias, I mean, the, the reason I, I specifically wanted Matias to play Klaus Barbie is what you said, there is a charisma in, in Matias that is, it's unbelievable. You know, in fact, he has made um, a big part of his career as the leading man in, in romantic comedies and, and, you know, movies that play off his, you know, incredible charisma. And, and I thought it was very important to make Klaus Barbie a human being because there is, there is a common mistake. I'll put it just... on my page. Sorry. Sorry. What was that? What was that? Oh. I don't know. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> um, it's, there is a there is a tendency of making the 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 Nazis into these monsters that are, have absolutely nothing to do with the human beings you've ever met. And I think if there's a, any chance for us to help avoid that this happens again, is to understand that these were human beings and human beings are capable of doing that. And I remember when I started working with Matias, it, the notion of a nation of Nazis came about. That you know, Barbie wasn't part of an elite group of people who were doing something, you know, on behalf of a nation. It was an entire nation who was rooting for this to succeed, and Barbie felt like a hero in the middle of a nation because he was recognized as a hero and he was accomplishing things that other people wouldn't. And, and to us, it was very important to really capture that Barbie thinks of himself as a hero and he doesn't think of himself as a bad person. So for him, it's not contradicting to, have, to be torturing some prisoners and to be worried about the future of his daughter in the arts because he thinks part of guaranteeing the future of his daughter in the arts is getting rid of the enemies of Germany. And, and understanding that is very important if we, if we are, you know, to do a film that can help, you know, make sure that nothing like this happens again. And that scene is the, is the essence of it all. It's funny because that scene was written like a, a week before it was shot, you know, we were doing a lot of rehearsals and I remember Matias telling me, I feel like my, that Marby lets them go too easily. And, and I started thinking, what can I do to, you know, justify more Marby letting them go? And, you know, the, the normal instinct would be to wrap him up so much that, you know, at the end he doesn't budge. So he says, no, he's probably innocent, but I decided to do the opposite. What if they have a little bit of a emotional connection? What if Barbie is the one asking for advice? And and you know, it ended up. I ended up writing that scene, scouting for other locations on the laptop in the car, and and I I agree, it ended up being the best scene in the movie, and it came from from the need that arose in rehearsals. And I also think it speaks about you know the the opposing views and in a way what Marcel says speaks about this rebellious group of people called the Jewish people which the more you push them the more they rise in the opposite direction and a lot of what he's saying 
in a way is a defiance of everything Barbie represents in front of him. So the, the scene really operates in a million ways and, and he's talking about the daughter, but he's looking at, at Bella's character. And, and behind here is another woman whose sister was just skinned by this guy. I mean, the, the presence of female victims and, and in the context of a person talking about his daughter, I found extremely um, effective and, and emotional in telling about this whole thing. And that's why I think it works. It's not only the tension, it's there is an intellectual tension going on because on top of everything, you have to think about it. And that's why it's so stressful. Right, and the layer also of uh, Marcel finding out that his own father had also wanted to be an artist. Um, and had pushed him away from that and sort of, and it, he's sort of embracing his own father's um, way of raising him in that moment. So there's a sweetness there, I think, as well. Um, and those scenes I found, the scene where he sees his father, I thought was really interesting because it reminded me a lot of some of the old Yiddish films or even the jazz singer where a father comes in and sees, but it's the role reversal where he goes in and, and sees his father and earlier in the film, of course, the, his father sees him. So there, there are these layers of, of the arts and, and parental relationships also there, which I found um, a, to be a really nice uh, thread that you carried through. Um, I'd love to open it to some questions from the audience. Um, if we can get Judy Bolton Fassman um, up to ask her question, uh, we can try this. Can you, we do, I think I press, is Judy up? Um, well, in the meantime, I guess I have, I have more questions for you um, because the all of the children in that scene um, on the train, but also throughout um, were incredible. Um, how did you cast the children, the child characters and um, to all of you and also um, particularly to you, Bella, what was it like to work with the other child actors? Well, the, the child actors we mostly found in the Jewish school of, of Prague we, we had a, a long process of auditioning kids and trying to teach them to sing Shalom Aleichem and it didn't really work until we got to the Jewish school of Prague where everybody knew the song better than us. Um, and Bella, you know, she, I, I honestly was, I haven't seen her in, in Game of Thrones, you know, so she, she did a small audition for, for this role and I immediately freaked out when I saw her and had no idea that she was already in a major series. And <laughs> I think you can see my daughter there. <laughs> Speaking of daughters. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and Bella, I mean, she was a genius, you know, I mean, she, she actually, she was so intense in the audition that my only question to the casting director was, you know, I want, I want to see how she looks when she's not tense, you know, and, and I remember calling Bella on Skype and, and seeing that smile that she's giving right now. And that was the end of the audition. I say, okay, you have it. <laughs> <laughs> She can do anything, truly. I mean, she is one of the most talented people I've, I've ever worked with. You know, and any, anybody who was there on set can tell you it's, it's a true, like, experience to witness the talent of Bella. And, and I'll, I'll say it in front of her, and I'll say it when she's not around. It's, she's truly one of the, the most talented people I've ever met. Thank you. Yes, yes definitely. That's true. Thank you. Um, I mean, I I loved uh, working with with the kids. I loved I, like this whole experience was uh, the, the best one for me. And when you when you called me, Jonathan, on Skype, I was filming The West Witch, and I wasn't having a great time. Uh, so it, it really helped uh, knowing that I had this to look forward to. And working with the kids was incredible. Uh, they they were all they all spoke a different language. Some of them barely spoke any English. So it was a crazy kind of experience to be in amongst like a group of kids all speaking a different language and me not having a clue what any of them were saying. <laughs> but I mean, I, I kind of loved it in a way um, because I, I felt like I, I, I felt like I learned so much from them, from like non-spoken 
dialogue like the body language and stuff I just like learned from these kids and they were all incredible and um I, honestly I I love them all to bits what a lovely thing to say in a film about mime oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh Judy's here so let's Judy uh welcome hi Ariana um hi everybody thank my question. Um, my question is that Marcel Marceau, of course, is a very famous mime, and I was wondering how that that image and that metaphor uh, affected the writing of the script, the production of the movie, and the acting itself. The fact that he's famous. No, the mime, the whole the whole metaphor of mime. You know, I guess of of, of um, the the uh, saying a lot without without words is that exactly yeah i mean it, it's uh it was the essence of everything i mean even the name resistance you know when when you study a little bit about mime you realize that the illusion of space is created by a mime you know when they put the hand like this you have the illusion that there's a wall because the wall is offering you resistance you know the it's the essence of how they create space um and from then on you know every single bit was always thought of as how would marceau do this you know a lot of it was from testimonies but a lot of it was you know a normal situation how would marcel handle this normal situation in a different way and that, a lot of that came from jesse honestly because i from the moment I sent Jesse the first draft to the moment we shot the movie, there was an immense contribution um, um, to the script from Jesse and, and, and the result of his rehearsals and, and the result of him starting to think like Marcel. Marcel wouldn't do this or wouldn't do that. The way he was moving his hands, you know, even if he's just walking towards the castle, if you see the movie again, you'll you just stare at Jesse's hands, you know, in every scene, Jesse's doing something different with his hands. And, and it's, it was very important for us to, to imprint everything about mime and everything about Marcel in particular to this, to the story, because that's what made it unique. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jesse, do you have anything to add to that about sort of when you were acting him, did was it a different experience acting a, a mime um, using less fewer words, I guess, to express um, what your character's motivations are, maybe? Yeah, well, I mean, he's he is like he's a person who has a sense of humor, obviously, but he's also like somebody who's constantly working because as the like for the first half of the movie, even after he is brought in to um, help these kids, he's still is holding out hope that he's going to get out of there as soon as possible and kind of work on his performance. And so here's a guy who's not just like, um, you know, somebody who is kind of a shapeshifter and well, that's not, not the appropriate word to use um, <laughs> with its connotations. But I mean, here's a guy who's not only, um, you know, kind of like thinks outside the box, let's say, but also like um, is intensely focused on his craft at all times. So I was thinking of more of like, I was thinking about him more as like an artist who's constantly waiting to get back to practicing rather than like, um, you know, the fact that his art is mime. Um, we have another question uh, from Mark Grella. Is he up? No. Okay. Um, as soon as he's up, we'll, we'll, we'll have him ask it or I can just ask it for him right here. Um, he... If you have a camera. Oh, there you are. Oh. Hello. <laughs> oh. Sorry. Hang on a second. Where's the, where did it go? We, we, can, we can hear you if you want to, if you want to ask your question. Okay. It's, so by the way, it's not Mark, it's Jen Grella. That's my husband. Hi, Jen. <laughs> I'm here too. Can, do you know how to make the video go? Okay. <laughs> my question is really just what I typed. It was mostly a question for Jonathan. Um, we were... Oh, we can't make our video work, so you'll just have to listen to us. Right, we um, still see a picture of who I assume is Mark. Yeah, that's Mark. Um, it's a question mostly for Jonathan. The um, piece that Marcel performs for the troops at the end of the movie, it was sort of a two-part question. Could you interpret that for us? And do you know if that was the actual piece that he performed? 
Um, it's uh, it was not the actual piece that he performed. It's a piece that our choreographer and Jesse's training trainer Lauren created specifically for the film. Um, you know, I I I wouldn't like interpreting it myself. You know, hopefully the 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 piece invites interpretation. Um, you know, I think it, it clearly has to do with what you just saw in the film and the connection that that what his story has with that of the Marines has, because the Marines, in a way, went through the same experience. Um, to us, it was important to capture that. How, how would Marcel connect with a group of tough Marines who just, you know, went through Normandy and and the last thing they think they're going to see is a mine. You know, they're usually entertained by Playboy bunnies or Marilyn Monroe, you know, and, <laughs> and suddenly they're in front of a mime, which they probably never seen in their lives. And how would he connect to them is was at the beginning, you know, how we started developing this thing. And, and I, I, it, and there's something also very special about the place where we shot that scene because it's, it was shot in Nuremberg in the Congress hall, which is where, where Hitler used to have his famous Nuremberg rallies. Um, he was building right next to the place of the Nuremberg rallies, this, you know, kind of a superdome for 50,000 people with a podium in the middle. It was a stadium built for him to give speeches. He never finished it, but the ruins are there and we shot it there. And, and it was really powerful because it was a, a German crew with a group of Jewish artists you know, telling a story of understanding in the sight of the Nuremberg rallies, it definitely felt like a kind of a creative vengeance against the Nazis. And, and it was really powerful. And I, I think we all felt that something special happened that night in a way we exercised the, the location. Thank you. Yeah, Jesse, do you want to add to that, to what, um, to what you put into that performance? Um, yeah, it was a, you know, it was a very, it was an unusual night for multiple reasons. One is we were filming in this area that had been built for, you know, so it was like it's been built for, um, you know, Nazi rallies. And so uh, it was something that tied into the story in such kind of an eerie way. Um, just on a personal level, it was, it was an unusual night for me because I grew up, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up like as the son of a birthday party clown. So I flew my mother out to come watch me perform. I'm in the makeup. Um, and which is incidentally the same makeup she wore her whole life as a clown. Um, I don't think directly referencing Marceau, but I guess just he became so iconic that it almost transcended his personal make, you know, uh, a style. And so my mother was watching it and it, it was just felt like this kind of night that, you know, transcended this particular <laughs> movie and had some, it had, so, it gave us some feeling about, you know, my, family's history and my mother's life work and all the work we'd put into the movie thus far. And it just felt so special. I think, you know, even the guys who were playing the soldiers who had nothing to do with the movie prior to that night, because um, they were just brought in for that scene. I don't know, it just it had like a nice feeling here they were in their city that they grew up in. Uh, but, you know, with this history um, hanging over, hanging over it, and here they were kind of as part of this, in a way, sweet reconciliation of something. Thank you. Your, your Minecraft was really impressive. Oh, thanks a lot. Um, I'm curious uh, what your mother's reaction was to seeing you in the, the makeup she wore. Uh, yeah, no, she was good. We, it's actually funny. Um, uh, the, Jonathan and I went back and forth with the makeup designer, Lizzie, for like two months. I mean, uh, as you can imagine from my body of work, I'm not somebody who um, uh, has, there's a lot of discussions around uh, my vanity in any way but like um this for some reason we just kind of went back and forth for months should he be wearing the makeup does it seem like too much what we were talking about was really is he if he's performing for these troops it does it alienate him too much you know that here he is in this full makeup is he's already performing mime in front of these like soldiers is putting on makeup like <laughs> such an extreme um you know chasm puts a, such an extreme you know chasm between the between them and then uh, when we put it on and we were in that location, it just felt so right in terms of the make, in terms of my mother, I think she approved, but also she didn't, she didn't, it was, she was, she didn't really have a say in the matter. <laughs> I can say his, his mother was very close to me in the monitor and she had a say in the matter. 
Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> that sounds. That sounds more like her. <laughs> Uh, we have an, another question here from Jeff Katz. Is he up? Nope. Yep, I'm here. I'll put my video Hi. on. Hello, Jeff. How are you? Um, I guess I can't put my video on either, but that's me. Um, so I had a question maybe for Jonathan, maybe for Jesse, uh, for people who are involved in the script. Um, you know, certainly Trump is not just our problem. very Trump related. One was kind of Bella's character's father's naivete at the beginning saying, well, they don't hate us and the economy is getting better. So things will work out. And then Matthias, uh, when he shoots people in the pool, said a very Trumpian, uh, either we have a country or we don't. And I'm wondering how much, I mean, that, I'm assuming that was conscious because it couldn't not be. Uh, but uh, how important is it to kind of strike those notes where we're seeing that rise in kind of intolerance, not just in the U.S., but worldwide? And I, I want to talk, I know, Jonathan, you have experience um, with anti-Semitism in your own life that brought you to this film. What, um, were, how much were you making this film just in reference to historical um, events, and how much was this about uh, contemporary times. And of course, watching this film, I'll also add that for me watching this film now in this state of social distancing and with all this conversation about individuals having to take action to make a, a difference and, and flatten the curve, really thinking about the power of one person um, to step up and make a difference uh, was, you know, watching it again in this time was particularly moving, um, but. Um. I think you can find echoes of, of you know, what's going on in the world in, in the film, you know, and, and it doesn't really matter if you do it on purpose or not. You know, the fact is intolerance has been rising uh, to unacceptable levels in the U.S. and in Europe. And, and it's actually, I, th I think it's a, it's a scary time because intolerance was rising when the economy was booming. And I think we're heading into possibly the worst economic crisis in the last 50 years. So what that does to the levels of intolerance is something I'm not looking forward to. Um, you know, I think it's, it's um, any, any film you make about this historic event is an important film that should have um, a warning for the people, no matter where they live, no matter where they are, humans are always at risk at falling into the hands of populists who blame everything on minorities and, and immigration or or a specific group. And and uh, I personally have, like you said, been a victim of anti-Semitism in Venezuela, and we, you know, had a country that loved Jews and then ended up, you know, electing a person who didn't love Jews. And and you know, you you never you should never take for granted civilization you know it's always um at risk of being lost and and it's always easy to destroy and always easy to point at the failures of a specific group than it is to take responsibility and and i also think that's why the movie connects to this moment in time where where we're being asked to take responsibility and but we're also witnessing civilian heroes saving lives you know you cannot bring a tank and or a nuclear weapon and bomb the virus you know the only hope we have to destroy the virus is a civilian doctor who went to the university and prepared for years to save lives and and i do think he, in in a way it's one of the reasons why the movie has had such an echo during this specific time um i don't i don't think i don't like comparisons to hitler about any particular leader um and I think it, it's important that we avoid them because Hitler was a, a unique um, character, a unique event. But I do think it's an important reference to, you know, sound the alarms whenever you see patterns and elements that were exercised by him in the 30s and in the 40s. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question now from Alexander Chalminski. Um, and I know you have to jump off soon, Jonathan, and this one is specifically for you. So um, you are muted, Alexander. Okay, there we go. Yeah, uh, just a follow-up question to uh, to Jonathan. I, I know you just mentioned that you grew up in Venezuela, and it's a very unique thing to be a successful director as a Jewish solo son of Holocaust survivors growing up in Venezuela. It's a really unique resume. And just you could talk about that trajectory of growing up in Venezuela, son of survivors in the Jewish community, and then bringing that to a successful movie maker. Um, well, my family came to Venezuela right after the war. They went to Poland to try to make a life after the war and, and quickly realized it was not possible. So they immigrated to Venezuela. Both my father and my mother were children when they went to Venezuela and made a good living. And they both became university professors and successful in their careers. Um, there aren't a lot of Venezuelan filmmakers and, you know, it does, it's not something that you really dream about becoming a filmmaker in Venezuela. But um, I, I made a documentary when I was 19 and HBO ended up buying it. So it sounded like I could actually, you know, be a professional filmmaker. And, and then I went to the New York Film Academy and went to UT Austin and did a year in the master's program and went back to Venezuela and made my first film. And, and then Hugo Chavez didn't like my film and opened a trial against me and against the movie. And that forced me to move to Los Angeles. And, and you know, it's not been easy starting from scratch in a different city without knowing anybody. But I have sort of been able to make, you know, two movies with with major international stars. And, and um, you know, that's that's where we are. Well, thank you, and thank you for making this great homage to a great hero. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I know a few of you need to need to go soon, and and um, and Jonathan, I know Claudine wanted to come on as well, um, and and someone has to, has to be with the the, the girl. Has to take care of the child. Uh, so we can we can do that stuff, and I think Jesse, um, you need to get off too. Um, and I don't know about you, Matthias and Bella, but uh, we will have Claudine join, joining us. Um, but I want to thank you uh, both so much for being a part of this and for the film. Um, and if you can just talk about, you know, a little bit about what's next for you and what's next for the film and what it's been like to release this film um, in the time where people are at home watching it instead of in theaters. Um, I've had a really unusual experience. Like I'm in a I'm in a college town in southern Indiana. And so um, this is like possibly a film that wouldn't have come to the theaters here because um, they don't have like, you know, like they don't get a lot of like the independent movies here. Um, so a lot of people are seeing it in my town that wouldn't have seen it now. They would have had to wait for it to come out. So that's the advantage. The other thing is, is like there are so many Jewish people here because it's a college town. So like Indiana is not you know, like doesn't, you know, they're all pretty much concentrated here in an India and in Indianapolis. And so um, it's, it feels like, I don't know, it just feels like it's to our advantage that people are watching it in this way. The most unusual experience I had is that the, we live on the same block as like one of the greatest cellists in the world, you know, cause she's a professor at the classical music school here. And she was saying that she wants to show this movie every uh, year to her students because the way the she thinks like the gracefulness of the mime mimics the gracefulness that she wants to you know her students to employ with the job so like people are having their own interpretations which is always a really nice yeah. reaction to something that's such a public thing like a movie but um anyway ariana thank you so much for hosting this okay so i'm gonna be tra transition out other people transitioning in thank you so much thank you bye matthias and bella as well bye. 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 Nice to see you. Good. Thank you. Okay. and bye 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 thank you for everybody who came here Bye bye. Thank you. Um, Bella and Matthias, you're in a different time zone. Are people seeing the film in Europe? Do you know? Uh, the, honestly, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I know that that the film has a has a date uh, for you know a release date for the German cinema, but we will see now what's what's happening here with the coronavirus situation. But it's a uh, uh, I know that 
no one of, of, of the people here saw the movie. So um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, not yet. Well, it will be the next wave. What about in, in the UK? Um, I'm not actually sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's out publicly in the UK yet. Uh, the last time I heard it wasn't anyway. Um, but I don't know. I, I expect it will be here soon. I don't know. <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be middle of June yeah. in the UK. Yeah, in the UK. That's cool. Tell, tell all your friends in, in the UK to the audience. Welcome, Claudine. Hi, thank you. Now, I was saving some questions for you because I know you were really involved in, in making the film um, look like it does. Um, Claudine, just, to, just an introduction, Claudine Jacobowitz became the first uh, female Latin producer to have a worldwide theatrical release in 2016, which is probably too late for that to happen, but, <laughs> but I'm glad it happened with you, uh, with Hands of Stone. And, she previously worked as the graphic designer for several uh, multinational advertising companies and has worked on design posters uh, for movies like Spider-Man and for Curb Your Enthusiasm um, and is producing partners with her husband, Jonathan Jakubowicz, who we just spoke to. So uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for the Boston Jewish Film Festival to, you know, for such a warm welcome to Tamar Simone and IFC uh, for making this possible. It's been amazing, um, you know, the outcome that we've had with the film and we're really, really happy despite the situation, but yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you and, you and Matias were both producers on the film. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your experience was working on it? Well, um, initially when we started the project, we needed to partner up with a European company and um, we, you know, it's interesting because Jonathan really wanted Matias as an actor from the beginning, even before we started conversation about producing this film in Europe. And he always, you know, really liked Matias's work. So before we even started the production part, um, um, Matias was was one of the you know main actors for, in Jonathan's head to do Klaus Barbie, and after you know the process started, we got involved uh, with the production company, which is Battalion Films, which is our partner production company in Europe, um, and that's how we started putting together the film, which is very very. Um, complicated and it had a very big structure. We shot it between Czech Republic and Germany and we had half of our crew from Czech Republic and half of our crew from Germany. We needed to find locations that, you know, that that were from from the era, that were from from that time and that and and due to the war some of European cities have been, you know, were destructed. So we could we needed to find most cities that had the architecture from the time and in Czech Republic and Germany, um, some cities outside of the main cities. Um, had preserved very well their architecture. So, you know, the challenge for us was kind of finding these locations that made production sense um, and, and financial sense to be able to shoot it. Uh, we were a little bit of a moving circus. We shot in five cities. So we started in Prague and we moved all the way to Munich and we stopped at every city on the way and we had like a little map that would go forward. And, you know, it was, it was, it was quite interesting and, and very exciting because everywhere we would get, we would just camp and take the entire city. Uh, so we were, I called it, the, we were like a little bit of a gypsies. Um, but yeah, it was, it was quite challenging, but it was definitely worth it. All of the locations that you see are real locations. And I think that texture and those colors, you can it definitely, um, you know, creates an essence of the time and, and, and the idea of what the photography we wanted to, to have it look like. I think one of the, um, one, I mean, obviously one of the most um, vivid and, and striking and, and upsetting scenes that takes place in that pool with Matthias, um, can you talk a little bit about shooting there and why, and, and that, I mean, just the blueness of that empty swimming pool contrasted with the horror that's happening there. Um, can you talk about that scene a little bit, both of you? Both of you? Well, I think, for, I mean, from our production side, it was just more to find a contained space that, that would work for it. I think more of the creative part, I would let Jonathan kick into that 
response if you know he's hearing on it um we usually as a production you know scout for different locations that would help tell the story in the scene where the director in this case jonathan wanted to tell the story and one of the proposals was this pool um and and you know it worked out as you can see very well because it's such a, a tense space and and in such a, a, a weird place to, to have an execution. Um, one of the things a lot of people uh, don't understand, which is really interesting, is that we shot the world of Barbie with a completely different lens. And our director of photography created a cinem cinematography um, language for to separate uh, optically both worlds, Matias's world and Jesse's world, well, uh, Barbie's world and, 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 and Marcel's world. So, so we use um, the cook lenses to, to work on, on, on the world of, of Marceau, which are inspired in the colors of Chagall because Marcel Marceau, mm -hmm. that was his favorite artist. So all the palette of the film you can see has inspiration on that colors. And, and for the world of Barbie, we have the anamorphic lenses, which, you know, a little bit, um, you know, has more created this depth of a field and and just separated you a little bit from the character so you know that sense there's a, there's a visual sensibility that was created photographically that a lot of people don't know what it is but it's part of it and that's the beauty of the language of film and our director of photography Miguel Litin who's um, been in our team for more than 10 years you know um, thought uh, very well how to create this separation of language so you unconsciously would feel a little bit un more uncomfortable in between switching with what both worlds so i'm kind of telling you the the magic between the lens um uh of that sensibility but i think matias can explain a little bit the the you know what he felt in that scene which was really really interesting when we shot it yes um well yeah, I mean, I mean the uh, the location was weird in a way because it was this old hotel and everyone everything was with this big pool and felt like okay, oh my god, it felt like that this place was so real that it happened there, you know. Uh, so and um, but what we did that was um, it was crazy because the pool was so big and the space was so wide that. Um, yeah. Anyway, it was a cold space. It was. Uh, it was a cold, horrible space, <laughs> but, uh, and uh, scenes were horrible because when we did a shot, the shot was so loud and the echo was so weird and frightening and uh, yeah, but um, it was, the, the location was perfect for, uh, yeah, for the movie. It's, there's, a, there's a really interesting question here. Um, in the Q&A, um, somebody saying, you know, there are so many Holocaust films um, from, you know, uh, films like Life is Beautiful, they mentioned in Inglorious Bastards, but also looking at documentaries, um, and then you're telling a real story. So in both in preparing for the roles, I'm asking to Matthias and Ella, and also to you, Claudine, how much were you referencing the language, the cinematic language that's been created um, for Holocaust films um, and how much of it are you basing on the, your own interpretations of this history? Um, um, I, were you looking at all at this sort of canon of, of Holocaust stories? Well, in, in the film? from a cinema, I can, I can talk from a cinematography point of view. I think, you know, we're not trying to compare or wanted to even compare ourselves to the big Holocaust films because they're just great, amazing films that we've all lived with and learned from it. And I think one of the things that we wanted to create was to have Marcel's world. And we wanted the audience to immerse themselves in Marcel Marcel's world, which is in, an artist. And we got inspired by, by his arts for Chagall. We got inspired by you know, an amazing, the wardrobe, which was a little bit eccentricity in it, which is part of Marcel's um, um, own per per personality. Um, so we, we didn't want to kind of like, uh, it, it, you know, compare ourselves or, or try to duplicate any other Holocaust films. We just wanted to create, you know, our own world on, on, on visually. And, and I think that's, you know, if you see our, the wardrobe for, for the wardrobe that we have, it's very, it, it has a lot of style. It's very uplifting, like it's not grayish or it looks like, like, like the traditional wardrobe from, from, from war movies, but because we wanted to create more of that 
kind of dif difference of, of, of artistic language that Marcel has. And that was across the entire, you know, art, art, artistic value that we wanted to inspire everyone to kind of immerse themselves in it. So that was a little bit of the mindset behind it. I think that's really one of the um, beauty, beautiful things about the film is it is a story about an artist and it's being portrayed um, with such artistry and um, and you see these uh, the two sides of the arts the um, the way art can be used um, you know you, we hear we see Matthias's character listening to music and it and it's not that art is the salvation but that art um, the artist spirit can can be used for good and and I think that's so beautifully portrayed in the film. Um, how did you, what are you guys up to now? I'm curious sort of how you shake, shake a film like this off, or I guess you're still involved in it, but how you shake these really difficult roles off um, and move on to your next thing. Can you talk a little bit about what you're working on now and where we can see you next? Um, Matthias, your mic is off, so, is on, so I'll, I'll have you start. Um, um, ah, Bella's mic is back on. <laughs> Bella, come on. So, ladies first. What are you working okay. on? Um, well, I was meant to be doing a film right now, which is set in, like, way in the past. So it's like a completely different sort of thing. But obviously that's been postponed because of obvious circumstances. Um, but, like, I don't know. I, I felt on set there was, like, an intrinsic kind of sense of hope and joy amongst the, the horror that we were shooting about like it was it was never I never left set feeling depressed mm -hmm. ever I always left feeling like uplifted and inspired um so for me it wasn't like a, a negative thing that I had to shake off like I still carried the 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 good memories with me of mm -hmm. of filming resistance and I I could return I could talk about it like resistance all day like it's it's one of my favorite things to talk about and to be a part of so I'm I'm trying to hold on to it for as long as I can, not, not take it off. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, and your and your character is is really an inspiring character. That you know we see the horror she sees in the first scene, and then um, she really becomes a, a leader for the other children and has this very special relationship with with Marcel. So um, it's beautifully portrayed. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Matthias, I guess you had a little bit more to shake off, most likely. <laughs> I, I have to say, honestly, the story of this guy was so interesting that anyway, um, uh, uh, I owe uh, Jonathan and Claudine uh, a dinner uh, because we, want, we need to talk about the, the whole biography of this guy because that, this is crazy. It tells so much about government, about um, agencies, security agencies, national security agencies. Well, it's crazy. It's, mm. it's, his life was so shadowing in a way. Uh, um, um, that uh, still I have some books here at home and I'm still reading sometimes stuff of his biography because you can, it's, it's, it's unbelievable you cannot believe it that this story is true it, that, that this guy was real yeah so um, yeah and uh, yeah I'm so I'm so excited to see the movie here in Germany this too you know with the people here because that's so important in this country to see to have this movie here still that people do not forget that's um really important yeah and uh, the, yeah and yeah so uh yeah and the next the movie the next movie i did i did a movie with Zack snyder it's uh called army of the dead that's the next movie i did that's that's what i worked on last year in america so but now there's a lot of free time and developing and uh, uh, developing, 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 and yeah. We're looking forward to seeing you in, in all of your next projects. I mean, this, it's, it's, it's a very different experience to be talking to you on the screen now and, and <laughs> watching you on the screen just a few days ago. So um, and I look forward <laughs> to seeing your next transformation. Um, Claudine, I'm imagining you're still wrapping things up with this film. Have you and Jonathan begun working on a new project? Well, you know, I'm now kind of resting a little bit. It's been truly about two and a half years of nonstop with resistance. And, and for us, it's, it becomes our life because we both, both work on it. So, you know, our mind doesn't stop. We're at night 
you know, discussing or talking about things like when we work on films that, you know, it, it absorbs our entire lifestyle for years. So we, we kind of finished this film in September and then, you know, we've been promoting it and, and, and getting it out and finishing it. So it's really interesting to now kind of, you know, have a little bit of, of time off on it. But it's been really, really fantastic to see the outcome of the film. And the, we get messages all the time about how important this film has been, and especially in this time and about resilience. And a lot of people connect to it, uh, especially in this and what's going on with, with in the world. So it's been really inspiring to see the outcome of it. And... And I think that I, you know, I always tell Jonathan, oh, I want to rest a little bit, you know, let's just take a beat. But then obviously we start trying to find a new story. Jonathan is a writer. So it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing because he, he starts to just sit down and, and starts writing and, and, and that's how our project come to life. So um, I don't produce for other people. I usually produce Jonathan's film. So I take a little time off when, when he's writing. Um, but now um, we have Jonathan's second book coming from a book that he wrote called The Adventures of Juan Panchar, which was a Latin American bestseller. And we're about to release the second book. So I think we're going to be, you know, focusing a little bit on, on, on literature um, and, you know, staying safe and just waiting to see what happens. Um, and I miss shooting a lot, but at the same time, <laughs> I'm happy that, that I'm having a little bit of time off. It's, it, it was, it was a very hard shoot, but like Bella said, it was, uh, you know, very rewarding at the end of the day because we knew we were doing something very special and we had really amazing partners like Pantaleon Films and Matias who we could have not done it without them. And, 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 you know, we're just happy and appreciative of every hardship and every thing we went through and the happies and the ups and the downs and, and, you know, the result it's, it's on the screen. So we're really happy. Absolutely. Well-deserved rest. Um, thank you all for being here with, uh, with us tonight and um, for some of you really deep into the night and for some of you in the, in the early evening. But thank you. Um, this has been an incredible conversation and it's such a powerful film. So I thank you for bringing it to us. Um, and everyone listening in, please tell your friends um, across the country and, and soon to be in, in Europe as well that the film will be available on VOD um, and is available on VOD now and that they should check it out. Um, and this Q&A uh, will be available on our YouTube channel so they can watch this after. Thank you for chiming in. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Stay home. Same. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Do we say good, good, Bella, goodbye. Claudine, goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys. We miss you. It's we need so to do another weird. Zoom. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so crazy that, uh, that uh, I didn't see the film on the big screen here in Germany. And I was, we, we, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, me too, just on the laptop. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy, huh? Uh, All right. Well, I miss you guys, and and I think we're still on it. It's still recording, actually. So I just want to oh. say the movie has been doing great, and we're really excited, and we can't wait for the entire world to see it. And thank you so much for for doing this. And I hope you guys are open to doing more because we've been getting lots of requests, so we're really happy um, that everybody wants to, you know, chat about it and.